all through the lockdown, the number of cases rose sharply. Now that the graph is like a, a steep rock cliff, we have over 200,000 cases and the economy has completely crashed, just collapsed. They have lifted the lockdown. Fortunately, a great majority of patients appear to be asymptomatic and the death toll is much lower than in the U.S. and lower than in the U.S. and Europe. And that's if we can trust these numbers. But millions are out of work. Hunger is setting in. What is happening in those villages that people have returned to casteism, feudalism, sexism in a moment of such fear despair and want to know how people will manage but Modi still wants to buy a, a Raphael fighter jets and spend 20,000 cores on redesigning Dali's central visa to leave architectural leave an architectural legacy I imagine in the meantime he will leave the management of the disaster to state governments who he never consulted before locking them down in the first place, but now blame them for the chaos. Does this blueprint sound familiar, y'all? You see how they do the shit all over the world? I'm trying to... This uh, article I'm reading, let me say, let me toot their horn. It's courtesy of your black... Oh, uh, no, I'm sorry, not at all. It's courtesy of... Um, uh, um, Breaking Brown. Breaking Brown. He and his slavish media will sell the double disaster to people as an achievement on his part. They've already started with their 72,000 LED screen virtual election campaign in Baja. While people starve, they got money for that. Already the narrative is quickly being shifted back to Communalism. Now students from Jamia Malia Islamia and G A J N U who were brutally attacked by police and Hindu thugs inside their universities are being arrested as conspirators in the Northeast Delhi violence, primarily an attack on Hindu vigilante mobs backed by the police on Muslims. This is the Delhi version of Bahima Corrigan. Between the two, some of India's best lawyers, activists, teachers, and intellectuals are, intellectuals are in jail on crazy charges. As someone said, Modi can sell a comb to a bald man. If we buy it, we deserve it. We can keep combing our hairless heads like fools. It's like Trump. This is what Trump doing over here. And I ain't trying to be funny, but at this point, anybody that um, don't see this blueprint, uh, Trump is dumb, but he's not stupid. And he's following the orders of somebody else. But you can tell he doesn't have much education. He's not very bright. Contrary to um, what he tells everybody but pretty much known to anybody who's went past the damn 12th grade. The question. The government itself has introduced the Digital India Project to harness digital technologies for rapid economic growth and citizen empowerment. The Aroga, the Aroga set to and the My Government Corona Hub have been introduced as a part of this project. In your opinion, what exactly does the Indian state mean by harnessing digital technology? And who constitutes the Indian citizen um, that it means um, to empower and in what ways? And who does this exclude, even if notionally? A majority of them are citizens. Um, the answer. Well, the projected number of smartphone users in India 
by 2022 is projected to be 440 million. That's less than a third of the projected population. And now, even children are expected to have smartphones for online learning. So, these great plans for digital India exclude a majority of the population. Like Silicon Valley, right? Run and tell y'all to get y'all a degree in tech, 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 tech. But you can't get hired up in there, can you? Wow. The apps you mentioned, they have been introduced even though they are still half-baked and imperfect. This Bill Gates type of approach that believes technology, all, etc., will solve the massive problems of health, education, hunger, poverty, and that's dangerous. We need political solutions. Justice, hunger, neo-racism, neo-casteism, Islamophobia, um, and ecological destructions are coded into neoliberal capitalism projects. Apps and pretend digital efficiency can't and won't solve the problem. Those are meant to stitch us into a privatized capitalist surveillance state. Y'all better hear me. Y'all better hear that. Recently, Devika a Dallas student committed suicide because she did not have the means to access online education, a mode that Kerala government was trying to um, regularize. Technology historically has been considered a means to uh, democratize society, democratize society. However, in India, technology has become an occasion to further marginalize and exclude, as we see in the case of Devika, online education, etc. How can we handle this contradiction in our specific context? Mm. I think I've answered most of this question in, in reply to your... Hmm? And, oh, okay. I know. You don't. Oh, okay. I'll come here. Okay. Um, I think I've answered most of this question in reply to your previous question. Online education could become a disaster for children who come from non-privileged backgrounds. Wow. Devika killed herself because she saw herself failing. I mean, falling into deep well of exclusion because she did not have a smartphone and her family was too poor to repair the TV set. There are millions like her, but even for those who have smartphones, schools and university campuses and all that goes on outside the classrooms are just as important for young people as what goes on inside the classroom. Dalit at Advasi and now increasingly Muslim students face great adversity in school and college campuses. But those battles must be fought by all of us. Isolating ourselves online will be the most dangerous thing that can happen in our society. I feel fear. I deeply fear this idea of online education is taking root. Governments have long desired to disinvest from education and privatize it and will try to take this route. We cannot allow it. Mm, interesting. Uh, question. Recently, you, along with many international activists and academics, um, launched an initiative called Progressive International. We already had left internationalism black and black internationalism, etc. But most of these attempts were dis integrated and somehow political imaginations are also nationalized and ethnicized. 
How will progressive internationalism move forward in the context of national populism and complete failure of world system? Answer. International initiatives are important because they give us perspective, understanding, and modicum of um, modicum of protection and paths of solidarity. Particularly now when countries like ours, the political rhetoric is high, I mean, in this ugly Hindu nationalism. But internationalism cannot and must not ever replace local organizing and protest. That would be a big mistake. We have to fight our battles. And for the most part, we will be alone. Nobody can help us, and nobody will. Question. Global resistant movements are now demanding more radical and systematic change rather than a gradual reformist optimist actions. How do you see this in the Indian context where Hindu liberal secular public intellectuals still stress on their optimistic reformist political agenda under a Hindu Nazi regime, basically? The answer. The short answer to that is that it is rare for people who have social, economic, intellectual stakes in the status quo to make revolution. They might want some repainting or new plumbing. A little tweaking and tucking will do, but nothing more. So they keep the faith while almost every public institution in India fails the test of justice, egalitarianism, and democracy. Many would flinch at your categorizing of this current regime as Hindu Nazi. But the fascist belief in the master race is not so distant from Brahmanism and the concept of Buddhiva, the Brahmins being gods on earth, like the white people. They the white, they the white Indians over the uh, lower class system, like these white people over us over here. Y'all better understand this history. Because if you don't understand this, you ain't going to understand nothing else. You're going to be happy to see Kamala Harris and think she's going to do something for your ass. Man, they got a whole different agenda. They ain't got nothing to do with you, ADL. ADOS, we already know, don't we? It's these other folks trying to convince us that we wrong and it's xenophobia. Hmm. The idea that some human beings... It's not hard to see how the idea that some human beings are inherently superior or inferior to others by divine mandate slides easily into the fastest idea of a master race. Mm. Question again. Lastly, in the ongoing anti-NRC, NAA, and NPR movement, we are seeing how the Constitution and the Indian national flag are being foregrounded. Our question is specifically about the Constitution. Do you feel that the Constitution is being used to divert the main Dalit uh, Bahujan Muslim question in, um, in that it does not allow us to center the identities of those who are at the front lines of the movement? What, according to you, would be the implications of this. Well, this is the answer now. Lastly, her last, his, his, her last answer, her last answer. Well, this is very complicated for a set of very good reasons. People are being forced to paint themselves into a corner. The Indian Constitution of which Dr. Am Ambedkar was chair of the drafting committee is a document that is far ahead of its time given the condition of the society that it was drafted for. In it, it was the first time 
in India that morally and legally was laid down in law that all human beings are equal and have rights. For a society as diverse as us in India and one that practices uh, caste, which everybody up and down the ladder except these dogs let me get through this. Um, listen, again, it was the first time in India that morally and legally it was laid down the law that all human beings are equal and have equal rights. For a society as diverse as us in India, one that practices caste in which everybody up and down the ladder except the very top and very bottom has someone to oppress and someone to be oppressed by. This is the idea of equality. Of constitutional morality was huge. The Dalits in particular, it has become a holy book, frozen in time. Ironically, Ambedkar himself was deeply disappointed by the many aspects of the Constitution and believed that it should be a living document that every generation ought to work towards improving it. But the need to protect it against constant attack by the Hindu right, what has meant that the demands to change the constitution were not progressive, but regressive. So we already had, so we had to have to rally around it to protect it. Those defending it, Particularly now, with the RSS in power, Donald Trump, have had to resort to a kind of constitutionalism, um, has had to resort to a kind of constitutionalism, I'm sorry. 2019 was a shocking year. The blatant violation of constitution by abrogating Kashmir's special status and enacting anti-Muslim citizenship amendment act implies that rather than rewrite it and formally declare Hindu a Hindu nation, this government is going to just disregard it and behave as though we don't have a constitution at all. The, demon, the demonetization of Muslims as anti-national Pakistan sympathizer and terrorists the vicious dehumanizing language used against them by mainstream media, the bias in the courts and the police actions and the outright bloodletting on the streets has meant that the only way protesting Muslims feel that they can protect themselves on the street is to wave an Indian flag. Mm. Wow. And recite the preamble of the Constitution. All this while Muslims are boycotted socially and economically, while mainstream TV channels openly broadcast Corona Jihad and human bombs, we hear horror stories of Muslims being denied medical care, both during the CAA protests as well as the Corona um, hit us, as after I mean as well as after when the Corona hit us. K. Pal Mishra of BJP struts around the Anartekar who led the chant Desh Ap Garandal Kol. Goli Maro Salon is the Minister of State and his finance and sits beside the finance minister at her press conference. It is a kind of brazen public signaling from the very top. We can never forget the sight of Faison who had a police lady shoved down his throat and lay on the road, dying slowly, while the police forced him to sing the national anthem. Can you imagine what would have happened if that had been done to an African American in the U.S.? Can you imagine? Where is our shame? Anyway, to answer your question about constitutionalism in India, who is allowed to protest, 
who is allowed to say what depends on their religion, caste, ethnicity, or gender. Y'all hear that? Because this is what is coming to up over here. Everybody is replacing us. And we, oh, Lord. Anyway, think about that. Think about that. To answer your question about constitu constitutionalism in India, who is allowed to protest, who is allowed to say what depends on their religion, caste, ethnicity, and gender. There is no such thing here as equality. Not even a hint of the idea of equality. Not even the pretense of it. This is what curses us at a country intellectually, socially, and economically. There is nothing more liberating, more exhilarating than striving for justice, for dignity and respect for anybody, wherever they are. To do that, we have to look through the prisms of class, caste, gender, as well as secretarianism. This applies as much within resistant movement as it does to the forces that we are up against. I agree. Because that's what happened with the Panthers. There was a lot of that um, going on. Um, anyway, until we learn that, we will remain forever stunted. Wow. You know, y'all, I hated I had to do this article in so many um, parts. But it was just that long and it was just that good. And I hope you can see the parallels between what is going on in India and who are the people that Kamala Harris are related to. She's related to the people that the Brahmin class that look down on these other people. And so when you talk about, when you hear people saying that she doesn't represent AD or ADOS, nobody got nothing against her personally. And because she went to Howard, that was just, listen, these people know how to come over here and take advantage of America's Immigration laws, immigration um, uh, 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 lineage in terms of the civil rights movement that we laid down for them. So they'll come over here like you have this boy Akon. And they're born over here. Therefore, it makes him an American citizen. But he'll tell you, um, you shouldn't even try to retrieve reparation. You see what I'm saying? He ain't no family member of mine. Because if his family was a descendant of a slave, he wouldn't open up his mouth and say nothing so ridiculous. And that's what these people, we not, I know I'm not personally got nothing against Kamala Harris. But I want y'all to understand what people are seeing when, when they see her and when they say, Yo, she's not us. Damn a color. Black. She ain't black. Now nobody wanna talk about no asterisk, damn color. It ain't about color. That's stupid. It's about lineage. And that's why her second appointment was an Indian. Not a descendant of a slave like them people she most of them she went to Howard with. She didn't see to put them in that position. No descendant of a slave. But who we do have, look at Valerie Jarrett. She's Iranian. Look at Susan Rice. I don't know if she's um, Iranian, but I mean, she might as well be. I would have felt better if they'd have got kind of, well, I believe that the kind of rise they could have got as far as I'm concerned was Condoleezza rise. <laughs> Condoleezza rise. Because I know damn well she know that, that was her neighbor and somebody she knew that got blew up in that church in Alabama. I would have took my chances with her. I hope y'all understand what I'm trying to say here. This was a very good article taken from MR Online. 
Indian racism towards black people is almost worse than white people's racism. And this is by Arun Dehati Roy. This was the interview with Arun Dehati Roy. Wow. All right, you guys. I'll see you in the next video.